Aloha and welcome to Campfire Read Along with the Ko'ohana where you can read along with us. I am Amanda and I will be reading Punia and the King of Sharks, a Hawaiian folktale adapted by Lee Wardlaw. If you're reading along with us, make sure you turn the page when you hear the bell. Are you guys ready? Great, let's begin. Beneath the rippling island water, near the shadows of the cave, lurked ten great sharks and the shark king who ruled them. The sharks never swam far from shore, for the cave was filled with fat lobsters, red as sunset, sweet as coconut. We must keep these lobsters for ourselves, said the king of sharks, and guard this cave from fishermen. And so they did, devouring anyone who ventured into the sea. In the village nearby lived a boy named Punia. Once his father had dared to fish in the lobster's cave, only to be eaten by sharks. Now Punia and his mother had no one to fish for them. Day after day, they ate only yams, which grew in a small garden behind their hut. And of course, his mother served poi, the bland, thick paste Punia made by steaming taro roots in the emu and then pounding them with a rock. Punia's mother never complained, but once in a while, he heard her whisper, Oh, if only we had a tender lobster to eat. Punia said nothing, but as he licked the sticky poi from his fingers, his stomach rumbled in agreement. One day, Punia wandered along the jagged cliff above the lobster cave. He gazed into the clear mint blue sea and saw the sharks were sleeping. Punia smiled, for suddenly he had a plan. Leaning over the water, he spoke in a loud voice. Ho, ho, look at this. The sharks are fast asleep. I, Punia, can dive into the waves and swim quick as a shrimp to the cave. I will scoop a fat lobster into each hand and my mother and I shall have a tasty dinner tonight. Did you hear that? Whispered the king of sharks. He nudged the others awake and grinned, his sharp teeth glistening white as bone. Let us race to the spot where Punia dives, then eat him as we ate his father. Punia picked up a stone and heaved it as far as he could. Splunk! The sharks raced toward the stone, thinking it was the boy. In a flash, Punia dived into the unguarded cave, scooped a lobster into each hand, and swam safely back to shore. Oh, king of sharks, Punia taunted. Look what I have stolen from you. He held up the lobsters and shook his wet head, laughing. We had been tricked, the king of sharks snapped in anger. How can this be? Punia laughed again and said, oh, oh, it was the shark with the flat nose who told me what to do. When the king heard this, he peered at each of his followers. Punia was right. One had a flat nose. So it was you, flat nose, who betrayed us. The king said with a gnash of teeth. I banish you from this cave forever. With these words, the king of sharks and the nine he ruled gave Flatnose a sharp nip on the tip of his tail and chased him out to sea. Chuckling to himself, Punia set off for home, where he and his mother feasted that night on tasty lobster. You are clever, my son, his mother said, but beware, you have angered the king of sharks, and he will not be fooled so easily again. Punia only smiled, for already he had another plan. The next day, Punia filled hollow gourds with thick poi. He placed the gourds with care in a large basket and carried it to the cliffs above the lobster cave. Oh, king of sharks, Punia called. I come to make amends for the terrible trick I played. See what I bring, a magic feast prepared by the Kahuna, our sorcerer. One bite will make you fiercer than the sun at noon. Two bites and you shall grow stronger than 4,000 sharks plus one. That is a generous gift to redeem such a small trick. The king replied suspicious. Ah, said Punia, but my mother and I are starving. I humbly ask, O oh great fish that you allow me two more lobsters from your cave. The king pretended to consider a moment. Very well, he said at last. But to his followers, he whispered, let us eat 
of the kahuna's magic that when Punia dives into the cave, we will eat him as we ate his father. Here is your feast, called Punia. With that, he turned the basket upside down. Gourds tumbled into the sea. Splunk, splunk, sploosh. Instantly, the shark snapped at the gourds, crushing them with one crunch. Punia dived into the water. The sharks tried to bite him, but their mouths would not open. Their teeth were stuck fast together with the glue-like poi. While they joggled their heads and bumped their snouts, Punia swam into the cave, scooping a fat lobster with each hand. The sharks raced after him. But by the time the poi dissolved and the sharks could open their jaws again, Punia had already swum safely back to shore. Tricked again, the king roared. How can this be? Punia laughed and said, Oh, ho! it was the shark with the gray belly who told me what to do. The king of sharks peered at each of his followers. Punia was right. One had a gray belly. You gray belly are a traitor. As punishment, I banish you from the cave forever. With these words, the king of sharks and the eight he ruled nipped gray belly on the tip of his tail and chased him out to sea. Punia chuckled and headed home where he and his mother feasted on tasty lobster. You are clever, my son, his mother said, but beware, twice you have angered the king. His rage will make him ferocious. Only Mano, the great shark god, could steal from him now. Punia just smiled, for already he had another plan. The next morning, Punia took his father's papa he'e nalu from the canoe house. He oiled the wooden surfboard, black with his kukui nuts. Then on the underside, he painted two blazing red eyes and a cruel mouth and laid the board in the sun to dry. Later, board in tow, he set off for the sea. The board was heavy and long and Punia struggled, lugging and tugging his way down the grassy path. But at last, he reached the shore. Punia gazed into the depths. The sharks were fast asleep. He paced 100 steps up the beach, away from the lobster cave, then he waded into the water, eased himself onto the board and paddled. Swift but quiet, out to the distant waves, he caught the largest one and leaped to his feet, balancing with arms outstretched like the wings of a soaring bird. As the wave carried him closer to the lobster cave, Punia cried in a booming voice, I am Mano, god of sharks. All who are loyal shall bow before me. The king and his followers awoke and gazed up. A long shadow with blazing red eyes and a cruel mouth was passing overhead. It is he. It is Mano, cried the king of sharks. Bow down, I command you. Instantly, each shark pointed its snout into the sandy bottom of the sea. At the same moment, Punia dived off his board. He swam quick as a shrimp to the cave scooped a fat lobster into each hand and started back to shore. Just then, the king lifted his gaze to take a forbidden peek at the shark. That is not Mano, he shouted. See, he has no fins, no tail, and his eyes, they fade in the water. It's the boy's doing. When Punia heard this, he began swimming faster, thrashing through the surf. The shark saw him and gave chase. But Punia was too quick. He found the surfboard wedged against a rock and still clutching the lobster scrambled on top it. As the king's mouth almost closed around the boy's foot, a wave caught the board and pushed Punia safely into shore. Tricked again! The king of shark raged. How can this be? Punia laughed and said, Oh, it was the shark with the crooked fin who told me what to do. Traitors! The king shouted his tail swishing in anger. I'm surrounded by traitors. As punishment, I banish you all from this cave forever. With these words, the king nipped the tails of the sharks he rolled and chased them out to sea. When Punia whistled home with his lobsters that night, only the king of sharks remained. There is no one left to betray me, the king thought. Tomorrow I will not leave the mouth of this cave. No matter what I hear, no matter what I see, now when Punia dives into the water, I shall eat him as I ate his father. Early the next morning, before the sun crept up, Punia's mother watched as he set off to the cliff with several kappa cloths rolled under his arm. You are clever, my son, she said, but beware. 
three times you have angered the king. He feels no fear. Only the wrath of the volcanoes could frighten him now. Quinia smiled, for already he had another plan. Working quietly while the king slept, Punia unrolled several kappa along the cliff's edge. Next, he gathered as many stones as he could find and piled them on top of the clothes. Finally, he built a fire. Using sticks, he edged hot coals among the rocks. Then he shouted, Flee! Flee for your life! The volcano erupts! With that, Punia lifted the edge of the kappa, dumping the stone coals into the sea. Water churned and hissed. The shark king awoke to find rock raining around him. He darted away, then stopped. He ground his teeth. This is only the work of Punia, he thought. I shall not move. Punia dumped another cloth into the sea, then another. Flee, he cried. The volcano! Rocks tumbled, water boiled and steamed. Still, the king did not move. He sleeps as deep as the volcano is high, Punia muttered. Perhaps it will take the noise of one to awake him. He glanced around, then hurried to the lava boulder teetering on the cliff's edge. That will make a fine splash, he thought. Aloud, he shouted again, the volcano! Then with a grunt and a groan and a mighty push, Punia sent the boulder tumbling over the edge. But as he did so, he lost his balance. He flailed, snatching a thick stalk of banana tree, which grew out of the rocks. He dangled there above the sea, feet kicking, heart thumping like a drum. Oh no! Oh ho! The king of sharks called. Who shall have the tasty dinner now? He swam beneath Pania and poked his snout at the water. You cannot hang there forever, boy. Your arms are limp as seaweed. Your fingers slippery as fish. The shark chuckled, then opened his jaws and waited. Frightened, Punia kicked again, trying to catch a foothold to scramble up the ledge. Too late, crack the stalk broke. Still clinging to it, Punia fell into the shark's mouth. Instantly, he wedged the stalk between the king's teeth to keep the massive jaws from closing. The king of sharks thrashed about, trying to dislodge the stalk. He swam in a frenzied circle until Punia grew dizzy. I must get out, Punya thought. But the water around them was inky and deep. Above them, waves dashed against the reef in a froth of white. If he tried to escape now, Punya feared he would drown. Then Punya remembered how easily he had fooled the sharks. He had an idea. He knew it was his only chance. In a shaky voice, Punya cried, Oh, if only the king would swim up into the breakers, I could ride safely into shore. But if he leads into the cove, I am doomed. For when I swim out of his mouth, he will surely bite me, and then I shall drown. The king of sharks heard this. He was very hungry. And so he streaked out of the depths, past the breakers, and into the cove. But the water there was too shallow for him. The shark stuck in the sand. Punia scrambled out of his mouth and scurried up the beach. Look, Punia called to the villagers. See who has come to visit us. He's not so fearsome now. The villagers crowded on shore. The shark looked so foolish, flailing in the sand, his mouth propped open, that they began to laugh. Snap! The shark's jaws finally broke the stalk. How dare you, he bellowed. How dare you laugh. I am the king of sharks. No, you are the king of sand crabs, Punia replied. The villagers laughed harder. Help me, the shark said. Growing afraid, he struggled weakly under the hot sun. Help me or I will die. That is what you deserve, Punia answered. But I will help you under one condition. You must swim far out to sea and vow never to return. I give you my word, croaked the shark. Help me, please. Punia nodded. Then he asked the villagers to grab thick sticks and poles to push the shark back into the water. Ever watchful of the sharp teeth, the villagers did so without a word. The former king of sharks slipped quickly away, his fin disappearing at last in the distance. The villagers cheered. To Punia, the new king of sharks. They crowned him with a wreath of mighty leaves and hung many lay around his neck. Then hoisted Punia to their shoulders and carried him through the village. A luau was planned in his honor, where maidens danced a hula 
which told the tale of his courageous deeds. And that night, always after, the entire village feasted on sweet, tasty lobsters whenever they pleased. The end. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you want us to read your favorite book, send us an email at tkoreadalong at gmail.com. Give us your name, favorite book, and where you are from, and we will give you a shout out. Can't wait to hear from you.